We've been talking about the beginning of the world as it is recorded in the book of Genesis. And as we've been looking at this, we've learned that the Bible tells us that God created the world and then he created a beautiful, lush garden that had pretty much everything anyone could ever want. I made the joke last week that I wonder if there were steak trees in the garden. You know, you go to one tree, and you, it's the medium well steak tree, and then, and then you go to the, well, the, this tree wouldn't be in the garden, but maybe there's somewhere there's a well-done tree, um, you know, where they, where they burn the meat and make it not valuable anymore. But this garden had everything a person could possibly want And then God took Adam and Eve and put them right in the middle of the garden and said, this is where you get to live. And you get control of all of it. You can eat anything you want except one thing. He said, there's this one tree. It's called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and you're not allowed to eat from that tree. Well, a short time later, unfortunately, Adam and Eve were tricked by the devil or or by a serpent, rather, and They didn't listen to God. They disobeyed him, and they ate from that tree. And I want us to read about that. The the account of that is found in Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. And it says, The snake was more clever than all the wild animals the Lord God had made. He asked the woman, Did God really say you must never eat the fruit of any tree in the garden? The woman answered the snake, We're allowed to eat the fruit from any tree in the garden except the tree in the middle of the garden. God said you must never eat it or touch it. If you do, you will die. You certainly won't die, the snake told the woman. God knows that when you eat it, your eyes will be opened. You will be like God, knowing good and evil. The woman saw that the tree had fruit that was good to eat, nice to look at, and desirable for making someone wise. So she took some of the fruit and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Verse 7 says, Then their eyes were opened, and they both realized they were naked. They sewed fig leaves together and made clothes for themselves. So after this, Adam and Eve were banished from the Garden of Eden, and in doing so, they lost access to another important tree that was called the Tree of Life. So as a result of their sin, they not only lost paradise, But they also, as God had said, would surely die. Now, a lot more along the lines of punishment would come from the mistake that they had made. But in this series, these three weeks anyways, we're not really concerned with that. We're more concerned with why Adam and Eve chose to sin. Because it seems foolish, right? Given everything that one might want and being told You can only not have this one thing. What would make someone take that one thing? Well, as we look at this series, my hope is that we can identify the things that made Adam and Eve do do this thing and that we can maybe identify areas in our lives where we might be doing the same thing. Because if you look at the scripture, there are three specific areas, three specific things that caused Adam and Eve to do what they did. The first thing is that they allowed themselves to listen to the enemy. And the second thing is they turned away from God's instructions. They allowed themselves to listen to the enemy and they turned away from God's instructions. Today, we're gonna look at the third thing that caused them to sin, And the third thing is this, they entertained the desires of the flesh. They entertained the desires of the flesh. Now, when I say they entertained them, I don't mean that they juggled for them or they danced or they sang. Or I'm using the other definition for the word entertain. This definition is to give attention or consideration to. In other words, Adam and Eve gave attention or consideration to to the desires of the flesh. They gave those things an opportunity to influence them. They knew what God had said, but the desire to taste the forbidden fruit was just too strong. I can only imagine Eve having the same internal struggle that so many of us have no doubt had many, many times. She knew what she was supposed to do. She knew what was right. She knew what God required. But she was so tempted by the desires of her flesh 
that she simply could not help herself. Genesis 3, 6 says that when Eve saw that the tree had fruit that was good to eat and nice to look at and desirable for making someone wise, she took fruit and ate it. The Bible says it was nice to look at. Other versions of the Bible say that it was a delight to the eyes or it was pleasing to the eye. One version says the fruit was beautiful. The fruit was nice to look at. It was pretty. It was tempting. When Eve saw it, she wanted it. Did anyone other than me notice that this particular reason that the Bible gives us for Eve taking the fruit has nothing to do with utility? It has nothing to do with accomplishing a task. It has nothing to do with a purpose. It's just Eve saw something that she liked and she wanted it. It looked good, so she took it. In looking at this forbidden fruit, she entertained the desires of her flesh. And as I've said in previous weeks, I really can't blame her. Because Eve did the same thing that I personally, when when I look at the log of my life, I can recall multiple instances of me doing the exact same thing. Knowing full well what God expected, but being so tempted by the desires of my flesh that I chose to ignore him. Am I the only one that that has done this? Is anybody else in that boat? Has anybody else found themselves chasing after the desires of their flesh instead of what God told them to do? I really don't think I am. One reason I don't think I am is because I had trouble deciding what additional passages to use this week because there are so many passages that talk about this happening. There are so many passages that talk about this topic. In fact, it would seem that the guy that wrote over two-thirds of the New Testament struggled with this very thing. Paul wrote a letter to the Roman church. And in Romans chapter 7, he had a, a moment of transparency. And I want us to look at what he wrote that, that is found in Romans 7, 14 through 24. And, and this passage is the reason that I'm using the ESV today instead of the NIV. Because when you read this passage in the NIV, it's really kind of kind of head twisting. You, you'll get confused and lost if you're not careful. But the ESV does a pretty good job of communicating it without making us get confused. So I want us to read this, Romans 7, 14 through 24. If you have the NIV here with you today, I want to encourage you, maybe just listen and don't follow along, but but do what you want. But here we go, Romans 7, 14 through 24. He says, I know that God's standards are spiritual, but I have a corrupt nature sold as a slave to sin. I don't realize what I'm doing, he says. I don't do what I want to do. Instead, I do what I hate. I don't do what I want to do, but I agree that God's standards are good. So I'm no longer the one who's doing the things that I hate, but sin that lives in me is doing them. Verse 18, he says, I know that nothing good lives in me. That is, nothing good lives in my corrupt nature. Although I have the desire to do what is right, I don't do it. I don't do the good that I want to do. Instead, I do the evil that I don't want to do. Now, when I do what I don't want to do, I'm no longer the one who is doing it. Sin that lives in me is doing it. He says in verse 21, so I've discovered this truth. Evil is present within me even when I want to do what God's standards say is good. I take pleasure in God's standards in my inner being. However, I see a different standard at work throughout my body. It is at war with the standards my mind sets, and it tries to take me captive to sin's standards, which still exist throughout my body. And then in verse 24, he says this, What a miserable person I am. Who will rescue me from my dying body? Those are strong words from the Apostle Paul, aren't they? What a miserable person I am. 
In other words, oh, how I hate this. Who will rescue me? And here's the thing. It's not just me and Eve and Paul who struggle with this. There's another instance recorded in the Bible. I'll give you really quickly in Matthew chapter 26. Jesus knows that he's about to be arrested and he's about to be tried and he's about to be beaten and he's about to be crucified. And Jesus takes his three closest disciples to the Garden of Gethsemane with him while he goes to pray. And he goes up with Peter, James, and John and and he tells those guys, all right, you sit right here, stay awake and watch with me. In other words, you just kind of hang out and pray with me. Give me some moral support. He says, I'm going to go over there and pray. And he walks a little bit further, and this is where Jesus kneels down, and he prays, Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. He says, if there's any way that I don't have to do this, please don't make me do it. And then he says, but not my will, but your will be done. He prays for about an hour, and then he returns to his disciples, and he finds them asleep. He wakes him up and he says, could you not just stay awake with me for one hour? And then this is what he says in verse 41. He says, stay awake and pray that you won't be tempted. You want to do what's right, but you're weak. The NIV says, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. You want to do what's right, but you're not strong enough. So Eve gave into the flesh, and Jesus foretold here that Peter, James, and John would give into the flesh. Paul gave into the flesh, and, and countless times I've given into the flesh. And anyone who's here today who's not a liar would tell you that they've done that multiple times as well. So what does that mean for us? Where do we go from here? This morning I want to point out to you three prevailing themes that exist in Paul's letter to the Romans in chapter 7. Three themes, things that, that define Paul's struggle, and I'm hoping that by looking at his struggle, we might be able to be helped in our personal struggles. The first thing I want you to notice that Paul writes about in Romans chapter 7 is the desire to do good. Paul had a strong desire to do good. He wanted to do what was right. He says this several times throughout the letter. In verse 16, he says, I agree that God's standards are good. He says, I I know that what God wants is good. In verse 18, he says, I have the desire to do what is right. I want to do what's right. In verse 19, he tells us that he wants to do good. And in verse 22, he says that he takes pleasure in God's standards. He says, listen, I know that what God tells us to do is right, and I want to do it. I have a desire to do the good things that God expects of us. Paul has a strong, burning desire inside him to do what is good, to do what is right. And honestly, I think that every child of God does, right? Don't don't we all have a desire to do what's right? Don't we want to please the Lord? Don't we want to do good? There's not a single time that I can recall in my life where I have sinned and I've thought, man, I sure am glad I'm doing this. I sure am glad I'm sinning and disappointing the God of the world, my creator, my savior, my Lord. I sure am excited about this. It just doesn't happen that way. And the reason for that is that God created us with a desire to please him. He created us with a desire to do good. In fact, the Bible tells us that we were created in his image. And God is good. Thank you for not saying all the time. And more than that, God placed in us an innate desire to do right and an innate understanding of right and wrong. Paul references this in Romans chapter 2. Verses 14 and 15, just a little bit earlier in this same letter, here's what Paul says. He says, he's talking about the Mosaic law, right? The the law that God gave to Moses for the Israelites. And here's what he says. For example, whenever non-Jews, raise your hand if you're a non-Jew. Yeah, yeah, it's most of us, right? Whenever non-Jews who don't have laws from God do by nature the things that Moses' teachings contain, They are a law unto themselves. 
even though they don't have any laws from God. They show that some requirements found in Moses' teachings are written in their hearts. Their consciences speak to them. Their thoughts accuse them on one occasion and defend them on another. You know that, that nagging voice inside you that always tries to get, get you to do what's right? The thing that makes you feel guilty when you do wrong? Listen, sometimes that's a conviction of the Holy Spirit, but sometimes it's the fact that God has written his law on our hearts. We know what's right and wrong. You can put two babies that have never been taught right from wrong in a room, and I guarantee you when one of them bites the other one to get a toy back, they're going to feel bad about it. Because we know right from wrong. This is good news, church. What this tells us is that we, if we choose to follow that part of us, that, that little voice, if we choose to follow the thing that's inside of us that encourages us to do right, that in doing so, we will please God. So the first thing I want you to notice in Romans chapter 7 is the desire to do good. The second thing, though, I want you to notice is the subjection to evil. The subjection to evil. Church, I love that we have a desire to do good. I love that God created us in that way with his law written on our hearts and, and with a desire to do what's right and to please him. But unfortunately, oftentimes, we don't follow that desire, do we? There's a reason for that. I want you to think about this. Before Adam and Eve ate that fruit, before that first sin, it wasn't normal to disobey God and just do whatever you wanted to do. Before that moment, no one had ever sinned before. What was normal was to do what was right and to please the Lord. But even though it was normal to please God, and even though it was normal to follow that inner voice that tells you to do the right things, Adam and Eve still chose to do wrong. Why would they do that? Paul tells us that it's because we are subject to evil. He says that we're slaves to it. We belong to it. In verse 14, he says, I have a corrupt nature. I'm sold as a slave to sin. And the same goes for us. We have a corrupt nature. Our flesh is a slave to sin. In verse 15, he says that sometimes he doesn't even realize what he's doing. Can anyone relate to that? Pastor, I don't even know what came over me. I don't know what came over me. Next thing I knew, I was sinning. Paul says that he doesn't do what he wants to do, but instead he does what he hates. He says, I know what's right, and I want to do it. But sometimes without even realizing it, I find myself doing what I hate. He goes on in verse 17 to say, I'm not even the one who's doing these things. It's the sin that lives inside me. I'm not the one who does it. It's this, it's this sin inside me that does it. I want to tell you the, the verse from this passage that I think I most closely connect with. The, the one that really speaks to me, the one that I can really relate to. It's verse 18. Verse 18 says this, I know that nothing good lives in me. That is, nothing good lives in my corrupt nature. Nothing good lives in my flesh. I have no natural tendencies that are good. Although I have the desire to do what is right, I don't do it. I live that life every day. Every day, although I have the desire to do what's right, I don't do it. If Christina was in here, she'd say, amen. Paul says, there's not one part of my corrupt nature that is good. Jesus knew this about people. He knew that this is how we are. 
When the Pharisees were complaining in Mark chapter 7 about the disciples eating without washing their hands, which, by the way, is a bad practice. But he was, the Pharisees were complaining about the disciples eating without washing their hands. And Jesus responded to them and he said, Don't you know that whatever goes into a person can't make them unclean? He said it's what comes out of a person that makes them unclean. And then he goes on to list a bunch of things that come from our flesh, from our fleshly desires. And he said, all of these evils come from within a person and make them unclean. See, church, we have a desire to do good. But unfortunately, our flesh is evil. And we are subject to that flesh. It's strong. It it, it compels us to do the wrong things. When we entertain our flesh and and we listen to it, It makes us, Paul says, do the wrong things. And that brings us to the third theme of Romans chapter 7. It's what one commentator called the hopeless conflict. The hopeless conflict. See, when you read things from Paul, I mean, we're talking about the guy who traveled pretty much the entire known world at the time, right? The guy that wrote two-thirds or more of the New Testament Bible. The guy that, that planted most of the original churches. When you read things from him saying, I just can't do right. No matter how hard I try, I just don't do the things that I want to do. Instead, I do the things that I hate. Doesn't that make you feel like just throwing your hands up in the air and saying, hey, I give up? Man, if Paul can't do it, who can? We're talking about the apostle Paul. What are we supposed to do if he can't do it? Paul goes on to say, I take pleasure in God's standards in my inner being, but I see a different standard at work throughout my body. He says, there's a war inside me between the things that I know are good and that I want to do and what my fleshly desires compel me to do. There's a war inside me. And then he says, what a miserable person I am. What a miserable person I am. I heard someone say one time, they were were an elderly person, and they told me, they said, Brian, the closest a person can get to not sinning is when they just get so old that they're too tired to do it. And he said, and even sin, even then, they still sin. He said, the only time you stop sinning is when you die. I was like, man, that's pretty meek. Not meek, bleak. That's pretty bleak. That's that's pretty depressing. The only time you stop sinning, Brian, is when you die. So it's hopeless. It's a hopeless conflict. What a miserable person I am, Paul says. What a miserable person I am. Do you ever think that? I mean, you don't think it in those words probably, but do you ever, do you ever find yourself sinning for the umpteenth time in an area where you, you're just sick of it and you don't want to do it anymore and you, and you find yourself sinning and then you just think, man, I am a dog. What a miserable person I am. And then he says, who will rescue me from my dying body? Who will rescue me from this flesh, this flesh that only desires evil, this flesh that only wants me to go get whatever it is that I want, and this flesh that someday will die when my soul lives on? Who will save me from following what my flesh wants and in doing so, condemning my spirit. As Christina comes, I want to tell you, I I love verse 24 where he says that. I love it not because of what it says, but because of what it is. See, there have been plenty of people over over the centuries that have said, Oh, well, Paul wasn't talking about himself here. Paul was talking about 
mankind in general. There have been people who have, who have tried to say, well, there's no way that the apostle Paul struggled with sin. That you're mis- misinterpreting this. Guys, I'm telling you, the language that is used here doesn't suggest that Paul was being metaphoric or symbolic in any way. The language that is used here is suggesting that Paul had an internal struggle going on with sin. And so in verse 24, he got to the point where he said, what a miserable person I am. Who will save me? I believe that when Paul wrote that, he was, he was crying out. I believe that he had gotten to the point where he was writing this letter and, and he was telling them what to do. And then he kind of took this sidetrack and, and started talking about the struggle that he had going on. It was almost like he was journaling. Anybody ever ever journal? Anybody ever write, why did I do that? I'm so mad at myself. I wish I could just do right. Verse 24, he says, what a miserable person I am. Who will rescue me from my dying body? And I believe in that moment, the Lord ministered to Paul. I believe that right there between writing verse 24 and writing verse 25 that Paul had church. Because in verse 24 he says, what a miserable person I am. Who's going to save me? And then in verse 25 he says this, I thank God that our Lord Jesus Christ rescues me. Church, you can say amen right there. I thank God that our Lord Jesus Christ rescues me. My Lord saves me from myself. And then he says this. He says, so I'm obedient to God's standards with my mind. But I'm obedient to sin's standards with my corrupt nature, with my flesh, with my body. He says, thank God that Jesus Christ has changed me so that when I focus my mind on doing what's right and I follow that part of me, I do what's right. I'm obedient to God. But when I don't stay focused, when I let my flesh have a seat at the table, then I'm obedient to sin. I thank God that our Lord Jesus Christ rescues me Yes, my flesh desires sin. It does. Everybody's does. Your flesh wants what your flesh wants, and it wants it now. And when we follow our flesh, that's exactly what we do. We sin. Listen, I've heard people talk before about homosexuality. And they've talked about, well, you don't understand that that these people are born with these desires. And I'm like, yeah, and every heterosexual man was born with the desire to have sex with every woman they see. And if we followed our flesh, that's exactly what we would do. But we have a choice to not do that. Thanks to our Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to read one more verse and I'm going to switch translations here back to the NIV because I like how it says this. Here's the thing. Paul pours out his heart right here in Romans chapter 7 and then five chapters later in the very same letter in Romans chapter 12 verse 2, Paul says this. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. He says, don't follow your fleshly desires. Don't entertain the desires of the flesh. Instead, let Jesus transform you 
by renewing your mind. Let Jesus change you. And he says, if you do, you'll be able to pass the test. You'll be able to do what God's will is. We're talking about paradise lost. We're talking about the first sin that was ever created. Adam and Eve allowed themselves to listen to the enemy. They turned away from God's instructions and they entertained the desires of the flesh. That's why they ate. I want everyone in the room to bow your head and close your eyes. Real simple question today. If you're here in this room and you say, you know what, Pastor? I'm just like Paul. I struggle. I struggle because my flesh desires one thing. My spirit desires something else. Those, those two things feel like they're at war within me. Sometimes I win the battle and sometimes I lose. Sometimes I win the battle and I, and I don't do the thing that my flesh wants me to do. And I get so excited about it. And I think maybe I'm finally there. But then sometimes I give in. Sometimes when I'm tired, sometimes when I'm weak, sometimes when I'm hungry, I give in to what my flesh wants and I do what I know is wrong. And then I feel like a dog. You know, I almost said this is a, a difficult one to, to respond to. This is a difficult word to raise your hand to because you know, there's guilt and shame associated with sin. But I'm actually asking you, if you're just like Paul, <laughs> then I want you to lift up your hand and say, Pastor, I want you to pray for me. If that's you, lift your hand right now. Who else? Hands all over the room. Thank you. Who else? Thank you. I see that hand. Thank you. Who else? Lord, I love you so much. But even though I love you, so many times I find myself giving in to the desires of the flesh. I do things that I know I shouldn't do or I say things that I know I shouldn't say. I... Lord, I don't want to do that. I don't want to entertain the desires of the flesh anymore. I... I want you to change me, Lord. I want you to renew my mind and, and make me a new person and transform me into what you want me to be so that I can prove and test your perfect will. And Lord, there have been so many hands lifted today, people all across the room that are saying the same thing. They're saying, I struggle with sin because of the desires of my flesh. Lord, I pray that you will first and foremost forgive us. Lord, forgive us for the times that we have done wrong. Forgive us for the times that we have displeased you because of chasing after our fleshly desires. But Lord, I pray that as you forgive us, that you will also change us. Lord, I pray that you will strengthen and encourage us. I pray that you will renew our minds and that you'll give us a, a firm commitment, God, to chase after you and to chase after the things that you desire for our lives. And Lord, I pray that you will 
help us win more than we lose. God, I don't expect the battle to end until I take my last breath. Because as long as I'm here on this earth, I'm going to have a flesh. And I'm going to have fleshly desires. But Lord, I pray that you will help us win the battle more than we lose. Lord, don't let us behave like Neanderthals. Don't let us behave like people who just see what we want and go after it. Let us behave like children of the Most High God. I worship you today, God. I thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Lord, help us to become more like you. Let us walk by the Spirit. I worship you, Lord. Hallelujah.